our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, anybody and everybody out there. I can't see the chat room. I can't see anything, really. Not from where I am. But I want to examine something today. Today is a good day for that. This day, the day where people remember things of the Sabbath. The day of rest. The day of resting in Christ. To rest your mind from all the solutions of the world and place them in the pure faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To do the will of God still on this day as Jesus did heal and Jesus did feed. So we are to do the same because a servant is not above his master. As servants of the kingdom and as joint heirs with Christ. So we have a work to do this day. And as we work, we have to consider why we work our hearts call in the truth of why we work for the kingdom and exactly what is the work of the kingdom what is the point of teaching what is the point of preaching what is the point of representing if it not be for the absolute and pure purpose of the kingdom of God. For this reason we must analyze so that our work will be of purity. So we have to talk about it. I wish I could see the chat room but I cannot so you guys just bear with me. First, let's examine us and the ones who are around us Let's examine this word, judgment. I pray the Father heals someone of being wrongfully judged or judging someone wrongfully because we're going to examine something that has been before us for a long time. Something we often miss because of the teachings of the world. But we are learning to walk spiritually. In Mark 9, 37 and 36, Jesus takes up a child and sets him in the midst of all the people, of all the disciples, of the twelve. And he took that child in his arms. Holding the child, Jesus says, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. When you read that scripture fragment it makes you wonder how are we receiving Christ by receiving a child and why would he choose a child? Why would he do that? And of course, this is when the disciples were disputing amongst themselves who was the, who should be the greatest. Who should be in the lead and who should follow and all these things have been. And Jesus tells them, if anybody desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and a servant of all. He explained to them a process because in order to be the greatest You must be the greatest servant of all people. Which is not perceived as being the greatest by man's standards. But it is perceived by being the least. 
To become the least among all of what you know is to serve all of who you know. And truly that is a great person. But Jesus takes a child, a child, a child who plays and does things, a child who's curious and has little boundaries. Jesus said, unless you become like one of these children, he later on said this, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Well, let's analyze a child. Surely he was not talking about the child's folly, because the Bible says the child's heart is full of folly. That wasn't it. Surely he was not talking about a child's ability to lie when they're scared and deny that they did something. That wasn't it either. So what's the difference between an adult knowing many things and a child? I'll tell you, a child is not burdened with the knowledge of men. A child has a new mind that can be molded. A child is a mind that can be formed and then they become who they are. It was written in the Bible that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In order to do that, you must throw out the things you have adopted from the world and become innocent again in the mind. In essence, become a virgin of mind. To be a virgin of mind means that you're no longer a partaker of those things you had before Christ. Mentally. It also means that you have cast down the ways of men and you choose to adopt everything from the Father. The nation of Israel, in the book of Jeremiah, when well, they did fornicate, they fornicated mentally. How did they do this? Instead of keeping those things of God given to them, they began to mix things from many cultures, many religions. That's how fornication began, of the mind. Fornication of the body does follow in the same regard. You see, fornication has to deal with you taking things into your mind. If you take many things into your mind, it dilutes everything. It dilutes everything. If it's diluted, it's not pure. If it's diluted, it's not clear. If it's diluted, it does not carry the nourishment it once carried. To date, this is the general word that people do keep as a diluted word. It's not pure. You know this by the questionable thoughts that people have concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he said, become like one of these little ones. So Jesus is holding a child saying, Whoso, whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. How does one receive Christ by receiving a person who is learning of Christ? This is a mystery, is it not? Mystery means hidden. And this is hidden from the world. The statement makes no sense to the world, nor the logical mind. The logical mind would simply say to embrace a child is to embrace someone in his name. But that's not what he said. Jesus said, whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. He continues to say, Whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. We've read this many times throughout the courses of our lives. We've heard this many times throughout the courses of our lives. To analyze this is to see the truth spiritually. A child has a fresh mind. 
ready to believe, aren't they? Children will believe just about everything until they reach a certain age. Just as we are to believe everything about our Father. The pure word, not the diluted word. But still, how do we receive Christ? By receiving someone like that. I'll tell you how. It is the Spirit of the Lord within a person that draws them to Christ. To receive an individual of whom the Spirit of the Lord is drawing them to Christ is to receive the Father. And here's how that works. Jesus says, Whosoever shall receive me, you're not receiving me, but you're receiving the one that sent me. Because God's Spirit was in Christ. You receive Christ, you receive the Spirit of God. The reason why you receive God is because God is spirit. So you have surely received him. To receive a child who believes in Christ is to receive the spirit upon that child that's directing that child to Christ. Therefore, you receive Christ. And if you receive Christ, you receive the spirit in Christ, which is God the Father. You know, it carries on. If you can understand that, to receive a child in his name is to receive him because it is the spirit of truth that sent him. You see, a person can do vile things, but when they do something vile and they believe in Christ and they cry, they're trying to get rid of the manner that dilutes the word of God in their lives. And we are sent to assist and help them. The unlearned often do fight change. And surely, if they continue, they'll be given over to something else. But they still reach... Many people thought that to receive a child means to receive innocence. That's not what that is. It's to receive one that by the Spirit of the Lord is trying to find Christ. Who's learning of Christ. The key is their belief in Jesus Christ. Now I give you this. I, 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 cannot look at a person and then say this one really does not believe or this one does but by the Holy Spirit I can know who defrauds the Spirit and who does not by the Holy Spirit but still that's not up to me to judge that is given unto me that I may help somebody else because they're truly walking into death if they don't change and we're lifesavers we're like an ambulance that comes up on the scene and people are dying. That's what you are. Sent in the name of the Lord to those who were drawn by the Lord. Some of these folks pray for an angel or something to happen in their lives. And I tell you, you're the one that's sent. You are. Yes, there are some that have crept into the house of God. There's one characteristic of a child that you should know. A child analyzes and looks at things. But a child is learning, and when you're learning, you're not attempting to be right. When you stop learning, you attempt to be right. You're concerned about you being right. When you are concerned about being right and somebody says something to the contrary, you get an attitude. When you get an attitude, it's revealing that you've been operating by the flesh the entire time.
Your attitudes reveal your operation in the flesh, but a child does learn. A child is slow to speak and quick to listen. A child takes what he or she hears and takes it in. It's in their minds. In fact, scientifically, a child learns many things before they reach the age of 10. Most of what they have learned in their lives, they will have learned by the age of 10. Jesus continues, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. That too is a scripture we must analyze. The disciples saw someone who was not truly with Christ, listen to me close, not truly with Christ, doing things in the name of Christ. Jesus says, don't you stop him from what he's doing? Because if someone does miracles in my name, they can lightly speak evil of me because they recognize the power in that name. Isn't that something? Which will, if it continues, in a lot of cases, it begins to change the individual. I can assure you they have to deal with their own lives, but it changes them. Jesus continues, for he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Stop. Many people have read this with a vengeful type mind, saying the Lord will get them. That satisfies me. You should never think that way. You shouldn't be motivated by the Lord repaying anybody for what somebody did to you. That's not love. That's not love at all. Let me tell you how we have done this to other folks. So that we can jump off the high horse and go back to the ground where humility truly is. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me. What is a little one? Is that not somebody who can't get it right, but they do believe in Christ? Isn't that us a long time ago who was doing everything wrong, but we had to grow and God gave us time to work some things out? Hmm? That word offend means to have displeasure in. Uh-oh, it also means to scandalize. One of the root words implies entrapment. But displeasure in is the most, so that if you look at a person and you can't make heads or tails of their authenticity, you ought to keep your mouth shut. If you have displeasure in someone that truly believes in the Lord and you don't know it, it'd be better for you that a millstone were hanged about your neck and that you'd be cast into the sea. You should hold your tongue from judgment. And if it enters your heart, you truly have offended one of the little ones. If you convey a displeasure in the little ones and it resides in your heart, if you scandalize, you know what the scandalize is? That's when you take someone and you talk behind their back negative things. You scandalize. What you're doing is you're talking down about them in public. Though it be your small little circuit, your little circle of confidants, you're in trouble. That's why you shouldn't entertain conversations about anybody. You should not do that. If it's not going to directly help them, hold your tongue from it. Purge it from your heart. That is a way of flesh that can lead to death. That is a sin unto death. 
That's why Jesus said it better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. If anybody attempts to entrap somebody else with challenging questions to make them divulge something so that we can be master over them, that's entrapment. And when you do that to someone who has just a little faith and you're trying to prove your point, that's entrapment. And what you do is you sow negativity into the one that believes in Christ. So what you're actually doing is challenging Christ himself. You're questioning the way in which Christ is working salvation in somebody else's life. When you reject the person who believes in Christ, you're rejecting God's method upon their life. You're saying, Lord, I don't like the way you're training this one or teaching this one. That's what you're doing. Unless you can read every thought that they have, you all keep your trap shut. Hold your tongues. Unless you die yourself. If you cannot edify your brothers and sisters... And don't say anything and keep condemnation out of your mouths. Because when you do this, you heap negative seeds upon your own head. And you will live in misery. You see, there's a promise in the word of God that you would have joy in this world and in this time. Though you would be oppressed, you would still have joy in this world in this time. Though you'd be challenged on every corner, you would still have joy in this world in this time. Some people don't have that. It's because they can't hold their tongue. They'll do good for a season, then sow more seeds of negativity against what the Lord is doing in somebody else's life. I tell you the truth, if it does not edify, which is to help someone in the truth, and if they don't receive it as help, in their lives, if it does not end up helping them, which means you have to speak by the Holy Spirit, you're going to be in a perpetual sadness, incompleteness, darkness. You'll have no joy. Do you not know that there is no joy in darkness? There's joy in light. There's completeness in light. If you're empty, if you're shallow, if you have no joy, come out of the darkness. Stop speaking of those things in the darkness. You do yourself a great disservice. You can't truly stand up when you still question the methods of the Spirit of the Lord. Time for us to be authentic. Time for us to be true to the one that called us. We are not here to establish our gospel, our doctrine. We are here to walk what is already established. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord continues and says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Into the fire that never shall be quenched. That means if something is causing you to offend, to entrap, to, dis, to, to speak displeasure, to, to scandalize, talking behind somebody else's back. Take whatever tool that allows you to do that and throw it away. If it's your computer, chuck it out the window. If it's your phone, cancel your service. If it's Facebook, close your account. If you're using Facebook to chat with your family and friends about somebody else, you need to close your account. Because Facebook is going to send you to hell. Some of you knew something was wrong with technology. You had a caution in your spirit in the first place. But because everybody agreed to use Facebook, you did it too. And sure enough, everybody who has Facebook has talked about somebody behind their backs. Everybody has spoken a displeasure of someone on Facebook. And I tell you the truth. Better for you to cancel your account. Stop looking for drama every single day than to talk about somebody. But if you cannot use it as a tool in righteousness, you don't need it. It's going to send you to hell. 
wonder how many people would conform to these simple truths of the Word of God. What causes a person to read the scriptures and justify their actions of negativity? What causes a person who has judged someone and causes them to read the scriptures to speak against somebody else? What causes the scriptures? What causes a person to read the scriptures to protect their own stance and their own belief? Let, let me share something with you. I don't need to use the scriptures to protect my belief. My belief need not be protected. You can't do anything to my belief, nor can you challenge me in my faith. You know why? Because it's mine, not yours. There's nothing you can do to challenge me in my belief of Yeshua HaMashiach. Nothing. But why would people read the word of God to point fingers? Why would a person read the word of God to prove a point? I tell you, it is to hold themselves up. They should have read the word of God to hold their brother and sister up. If I saw Tatum falling, I would labor in the word and say, Tatum, Tatum, read Thessalonians 1.13. You've been sanctified from the beginning. If I truly do love my brothers and sisters, I'm going to use the scriptures for the sake of edifying someone like Jesus said, not destruction. Why do you think Jesus comes at the end to execute judgment upon the earth? I'll tell you why, because you're not supposed to do it. See, they mix the word judgment up. In one context, judgment means to rightly apply the balances of God in a situation. That means to rightly apply light to a situation. That means you have to have discernment if a person's in a trial. Right? If a person is in a trial, the Lord's not going to have you interfere with that. But if a person is right there at the gates of hell, you've got to render truth. Not condemnation. We cannot be people that sit out there and we look at the darkness and say that's darkness. We know it's darkness and so does darkness. Everyone knows if they sin or not. Do you know that? I've heard little sly phrases that inch into the word of God, inch into Christians' minds to make them believe that they don't know if they're sinning or not. You were born into sin, therefore, to be righteous like your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is righteous, who was sent by the Father is to stand in righteousness. And everything else is unrighteousness. It's that simple. If something is going to be counted against you, you must be aware that you've done it. That means you know what you're doing. And the Lord is surely opening the eyes of many folks. These scriptures also means those of you who are truly called by the Lord. Stop hearing the words of your foes and your enemies as an offense in the first place. Why would you be offended if somebody judged your castle walls? Don't be offended. You have work to do. You see, it's like this. If a person condemns me and I'm not preoccupied with the work of the kingdom, I'll be offended. But if someone condemns me and I have work to do for the kingdom, I'll pray for the one who condemned me and keep going. I have no offense in me. Hmm. That's something. I think it's very special the things that the Lord teaches us. I think it is. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. Your feet. What do your feet do? Your feet help you to stand, don't they? Don't they help you to stand? Your feet do. Now listen, first he said, and everything he says is important. First he says your hand. What do your hands represent? That represent your works. He just talked about people offending the little ones. 
And then he spoke about the hands. Your hands represent your work. If your work in this world offends one of these little ones, cut it off. When you get behind Facebook and you're talking to people or in a text message, you can't help but to discuss somebody else's business. <clears throat> the little one may not know it, but they're going to find out anyway. But what you're doing is conveying your displeasure at them. You're scandalizing them to somebody in your close-knit circle. And you're doing that by way of your works. Because a form in life is part of your work. So what kind of work are you doing? Imagine that one. Everything you do in life is a portion of your work. How you live your life is your works. That is your works. So let me ask you this. What are your works? Do you spend most of your time complaining and soothing yourselves? Showing your displeasure of somebody else? Because if you do, those are your works. Those are your works. Secondly, he says, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. What do your feet represent? They help you to stand and they give you mobility. With your feet, you do walk everywhere. You wear, you wear many different types of shoes, but they carry you to places. Listen. The Lord said, don't be a tail bearer. Don't have feet swift to shed innocent blood. Let me give you an example of that. Suppose you had an inkling that somebody was just totally corrupt internally. Suppose that corruption was conveyed to the world. Suppose someone told you, you rushed to turn the TV on to confirm it. I tell you the truth. You're a partaker of shedding the blood of somebody else. Your feet are swift to run to mischief. My Lord, it seems like all of America has become this way. They are swift and they're calling. You know what the American people are doing? They're no different than those of old who used to say off with their head. Chop their heads off. Big crowds would form during executions. I ask you this. It's a sad thing to see Christians standing in the circle with everybody else to see the execution of somebody else. These debates, they're executions upon the lives and the families and those who are running for office. Executions. And people do love to have it so, don't they? They love to see people executed, torn down in life, defamed. But they themselves, if it ever happened to them, you know what they would do? Lord, this is unfair. I've done nothing to warrant this. Really? You see, by you joining in with those who love to see an execution, do you not know you're a partaker in the execution? I watched a debate last time. And I found out everything I need to petition for. Those folks are in trouble on both sides. And you don't even know it. The truth is, so is Obama. They're in trouble. They are really in trouble. Christian's role is not to take a knife and chop the heads off of people. It's not to partake in an execution and clap your hands at somebody else's demise. If you rejoice over the demise of somebody in this world and you don't know their hearts or anything else, you know what they have told the people. Michael himself dared not bring accusation against Satan when disputing over the body of Moses. 
Why didn't he? Because that's not the way of the Lord. So I ask you this, why would a Christian do that to their fellow man? It's still not the way of the Lord. When your feet are swift to see drama and to see death and to see the fall of another, if you rejoice in the fall of another, you're forgetting God's grace through Christ. You're forgetting God's mercy through Christ. You're not operating under the blood of the Lamb, nor under the gift of humanity, which is the grace and the mercy of God. You're operating under the law. And anybody who operates under the law is guilty by the law. And you'll have no joy. The reason why people have to fight to keep what they have is because it does not belong to them. You never have to fight to keep anything that truly belongs to you. When was the last time you fought to keep your skin color? When was the last time you fought to keep your eye? When is the last time you fought to keep your toes? You fought to keep your hands? You don't fight to keep those things that truly belong to you. You fight to keep those things that can be taken away from you. And anything can be taken away from you from the one who granted it to you. And the world will fight to those things they do love. I say that all the time because it exposes the heart of a person. If a person fights to uphold themselves, they do love themselves more than they love you. If a person fights you to be right, then they're, they want to be right. They're fighting for their pride, which they do love. You know what that's called, folks? That's called simple discernment. That's a true natural discernment. If you take those things in, you'll see it to be true. You'll also see it to be very simple. People show you who they are every day of your lives. And people always try to convince you to believe the way they believe. Don't you find that strange? That gives you an insight into the war that's happening. Everybody a Christian talks to, they're going to talk to somebody who tries to convince them of something else outside of the principles of Christ. That lets you know you're at war and that you truly must stay the path of Christ. But if you have the way, nobody can take the way from you. Nor can a person tempt you from going outside of the way. All the temptations will no longer work. I find it curious when it says, pray that you're worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Right? Because it says a temptation will come upon all the earth. And because of that temptation, all those things are temptations. But if you're purged internally, washed by the blood of the Lamb truly, you can be tempted and drawn away of your own lust because you have purged yourself of lusts. And if you have done that, guess what? You are standing before the Son of Man. In fact, the Son of Man knows all about you. And if you stand before the Son of Man, you're standing in His capacity, not your own. If you stand in your own capacity, you're just standing. But to stand before the Lord is to stand in His capacity. To stand in His likeness. To stand in His image. To stand in His doctrine. You must stand in Him in all things. Or you will not be standing before the Son of Man. There are two ways you stand at the end. Before the Son of Man. Or before the judge. Which one do you choose? Because you're making that choice with everything that you do. I'll tell you the truth. Many things have become diluted. And are no longer pure. Diluted with philosophies of the world. The mindsets of certain theologians who want to believe everything in this realm and not spiritually. In fact, 
the greater amount of theologians had to say to, to believe the Bible, the entire Bible, is a metaphor. Theologians who bridge the gap between reality and the spiritual, who have become the authorities on what Jesus meant to say. My goodness, they're calling evil good and good evil. It is evil for someone to take the words of Christ and say, well, what he meant to say, no, he said what he said, and it must be spiritually discerned. Those who are called of the Lord can hear the words of the Lord. Those who are not called up the Lord do not hear his voice. You see, the Lord said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. That's why it says, and if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived, but it's not possible. Why? Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. It'll come close, but no cigar, as they say. A believer in Christ will never be deceived. They don't want to hear anything else. There's a lot of things that are foreign to you. A lot of things are foreign to you. But I ask you this, have you entertained them? Do you entertain things that are foreign to you? Sometimes you go into a subject and the Holy Spirit will tell you, don't go into that subject. And you do it anyway. And sure enough, when you go into that subject, what do you begin to do? You begin to doubt God's word. The foundation of God's word is sifted right out of your life. Not that the foundation is ever removed, but just for you, it causes doubt. It sheds doubt upon what you've read. The proof of concept is this. If you only abide it in the doctrine of Christ, there would be nothing to challenge your faith in him. You would have all faith in Christ. The reason why people don't have faith is because the other knowledge is fighting against the knowledge of God in their lives. I think the Lord, he may be too stupid to adopt everybody else's doctrines and hearsays and ways so that I may only receive of the Lord, which is why my faith is never challenged. This brain I have must be wired up wrong because most of what I hear out there in the world is pure gibberish. Gibberish, unfounded. It doesn't work. I never choose to explore it. When I read the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very thought that comes to my mind is I'm home. That's what I accept. Nothing can make me waver. Many things have tried. I've been tried in, in, in everything that I do believe of Christ. And you will be too. That's why when you're given a revelation, you should meditate upon that revelation. You should see it in the real world that you may take that revelation in. You do not read, close the book, and go back to your household duties or your job duties, corporate duties, military duties, whatever you have. You don't do that. You read the Word of God, chunk by chunk, just like you're eating a steak, and you take it in, and you see it working. You meditate upon it again, and you understand it. Let it become part of you that you begin to walk by the gospel of Jesus Christ automatically. People's faith wavers because other knowledge is fighting against it. Jesus says, for everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves. And have peace one with another. That was Mark 9, 49 and 50. Listen, it says, For everyone shall be salted with fire. Did you ever read that before, you all? Everyone will be salted with fire. What does that mean? That means the flavor of Christianity within you is only flavored after massive heat
all the salt in you, all the flavor in you is only added with the hottest of trials. That's pure salt. I call that pure salt. Forged in fire. It is that way that you don't lose it. That means there are some folks who claim to have the salt, but it doesn't taste like salt because they have gone through nothing to obtain it. Do you not know your soul is forged through pain? Pain forges your soul. A hot fire a trying time gives you salt. And do you know why? It's because when you go through traumatic experiences and you come out and you know the Lord did it, nothing can make you waver again. Everything you go through concerning flames and you were delivered from and you were not consumed, which is why the word fire is used both for its intensity and that nothing can, nothing can scarcely survive it. When you go through that fire and impurities are burned off and everything else and you realize you've gone through that fire, the Lord delivered you from that fire, no one can shake your faith in that area. If your arm was chopped off in an accident and the Lord told you with the other arm, put that arm back, I'll grow it together. And you put it back and it grew together. No one can ever tell you that the Lord can't do a miracle. If your arm was severed, it would hurt like you wouldn't believe. Aspirin would not help it, nor would any amount of medication. But if the Lord said, you place that arm beside you and I'll heal it. And it was healed after you felt all that pain. First of all, you'd say, oh no, that was real because I remember the pain. Lesson number one. The pain you remember lets you know the situation is, was real, not a fantasy. And when Jesus places it back and it heals, point number two, he does the impossible after a lot of pain is felt. Point number three, no one can ever tell you it did not happen. So then, you have faith in areas well beyond everybody else. He did the miracle to you and nobody else saw it and your faith was strengthened. I tell you today, he's done many miracles in your life. Many. But I ask you this, was the pain so intense? Right? If the pain was slight, you'll say, well, maybe it was happenstance. But if it was great pain, you'll say, no, the Lord delivered me from this. He did this. And nobody can ever challenge you in that area. If the traumatic experience is slight, no impact. But if it's major, you'll say, oh no, the Lord did this. Now you're qualified to edify your brothers and your sisters who are also in pain. Now you're qualified to stand there without hypocrisy and say, Jesus delivers if you had never been delivered by the Lord, how can you stand and say Jesus delivers? You had to have that pain in your life, that discomfort, those, those manifold situations in your life. Or else you would be a hypocrite. Never having gone through something and saying the Lord delivers. Here's how that works when you don't go through something. When you don't go through something... And you sit there and say, the Lord delivers. I can assure you that hours later, you'll be calling out for the Lord's help. Why would you call out for his help if you know he delivers? Think about that. See, I know my Lord delivers. I need not say, listen, the one thing I never ask him for is, Lord, help me. You know why? He said he would take care of me like he takes care of everything else. He would supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He instructs me to focus on my brothers and sisters and to give my life for them if necessary. In other words, Michael, the hard-headed one, take no thought of your life. But feed my sheep. That means to do his will. 
I don't pray for me. I'm praying for others. See, I trust him. And that trust has been challenged. In a very harsh way. I trust the Lord. Because one time I called out for him. For almost two. For almost a year and a half. And it appeared he never showed up. And I said, Lord, why haven't you shown up? A year and a half. And believe me, we're talking about a torturous year and a half. While I began to meditate, he didn't show up. I saw how he showed up from the beginning. He was forging my soul through great pains. He was refining me for massive discomfort. He showed me that nothing is happenstance and all things are purpose for those who are called by the name of the Lord. He demonstrated that his love is eternal and it is enough. He conveyed to me he will truly never leave us nor forsake us but is always working with us. You see, that entire time, while I wanted to be rescued, he was teaching me. He put me there in the first place, that I may receive of him and have no distractions. And surely I had no distractions. And I tell you this, after I learned a great many things when he did deliver me, there is not a soul in heaven, in earth, or beneath the earth, or out there in the universe, that can ever tell me, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, can't deliver. They can't tell me that. Nor can anybody tell me Jesus fails. Nor can anybody tell me the Father is not aware of all things. See, they can't tell me these things. They can't tell me because parts of me were forged through great pains and sorrow. But he showed me the biggest lesson of all. While I was crying out for me, I was reminded by the Holy Spirit. You know what it said? I thought you would lay your life down for another. That's what it said. I thought you would lay your life down for another. And why are you crying out if you'll lay your life down for another? I learned so many things that the Lord heard us the first time. But when the Holy Spirit conveyed to me internally saying, I thought you would lay your life down for another, everything kind of halted. I felt sorrowful because I said, Lord, forgive me, I was a hypocrite. Saying I would lay my life down for another, but asking you to save my life. See, I realized to lay your life down for another is also to go through that fire for the sake of somebody else. That you be for forged and perfected for the sake of somebody else. That your life be torn down. That you may see the delivering hand of the living God. That you may edify your brothers and sisters. I truly had to repent and said, Lord, that's a hypocrite. Forgive me for being a hypocrite. And we know where hypocrites go. They go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. From that day forward, and that was a long time ago, I never prayed for myself ever again. Because the Lord already knows what I need before I ask him. And that's why he gave instructions to pray. Like he said to pray. If a person truly trusts in the Lord, then they know he's forever seeing his children. If he's forever seeing us and he already knows our needs, we need not ask him for it. But I ask you this. Who's ready to lay their lives down for the sake of their brother and their sister? Who's ready to go through it for somebody else? Because I tell you the truth, that is love. That's love. That is love. And do you not know in your life you've been trained, you're going through training to do this?
Can some of you now see, placing in perspective that one thing? The Lord does not raise up his children to be hip- hypocritical. We, we can't say. We can never say that scripture and truly believe in it unless we have performed it. How can we believe in that scripture and be ready to do so? And when something goes wrong in our lives, we cry for the Lord like he's not looking. He is not a man that he should lie. He is not like man. He is aware of all things. I tell you, because you believe upon his son, Jesus of Nazareth, his eyes are perpetually on you. Learn the method of his way. Look deeper into him and say, Lord, what are you showing me? What are you showing me? And you'll find it. See, when you believe that the Lord is always looking at you because he already is, you begin to operate by faith. As you begin to truly sacrifice things for your brothers and sisters, willing to lay down your life for somebody else, God will never require your life. Through training, it looks like he may require your life, but he's showing you something. He's adding salt to you. And the scripture says again, for everyone shall be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. If you belong to him, you will obtain salt by the hand of God. And it will come only through fire. And every sacrifice will be salted with salt. But listen, guess what? He salted you, didn't he? He salted you. Didn't he? If he salted you, then what is the sacrifice? That sacrifice is you, isn't it? For the sake of somebody else, isn't it? Then he says, salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith will he season it? Then he says, have salt in yourselves. In other words, accept it within yourselves and have peace one with another. When you go through these things, you can't be offended. You don't practice hatred. Nobody can turn your stomach anymore. Because truth, which is also love, which is also light, is too powerful for all those childish things. Then you're truly seasoned. And when you're seasoned, then you're ready to give an answer always to anybody. This is our process. It's your process. Remember you received that salt with fire. Traumatic situations. To receive of the Lord because he does not want your words to be hypocritical but qualified. Whom he called he also qualified. Everything you speak must be qualified. And it must be qualified by truth. It is hypocritical to speak a thing that you really don't believe in yourself. You can't say to someone... The Lord delivers, therefore stand, and you cry two minutes later. Gentlemen, you can't sit there and say, you can stand in the strength of the Lord, and then two days later you fold up like a lawn chair because something went very wrong in your household. Speak those things that you're salted with, and the salt comes by way of fire. Those of you who suffer now, ask yourself something. Will you truly lay down your life for another? I tell you, the world believes in Hollywood too much. We see a person giving up their lives, but we're disassociated from the pain that person feels. And when the pain hits us, what's the first thing we say? Oh, I can't take it. Well, that's a lying word. Let me tell you why. 
Many people have said, oh, I can't take this another day. But you went another day. Just lying the whole time, saying those words. I can't take it. I'm not going to make it. I'm this and that. Just speaking lies out of your mouth and you're still here. What is a falsehood? It's a lie. To speak defeat is also to speak a lie. To say you can't do something is also a lie. To say you're not going to make it is a lie. Do the children of the living God lie? God didn't give us that to do, did he? And what does that do to your mind? It causes you to think. See, what you begin to say, what you begin to mimic enters back into your heart it comes up the heart enters back into the mind and goes in a big circle now you can't get rid of it and then you slowly become your soul becomes the very things you keep when I'm in a situation and it looks like I'm not going to make it I don't speak a word I don't confer with anything I'll say the Lord's will be done let's keep going Whatever the outcome is, I'm not in charge of my life because I gave my life to Christ. Did you give your life to Christ? I need not attempt to do some of the things that the world does. Managing every aspect of my life, I need not do that. Because I gave my life to Christ. I'm not interested if I die or live. I'm not. Because I gave my life to Christ. I'm only interested in being effective for my brothers and sisters, being a real example in the world in everything that I do. If somebody sees me walk to a chopper, walk to the car, something like that, I want to be a demonstration for the kingdom and truth. In other words, I want to actually live the way. I don't want anything in flesh to be within me, which is hypocrisy. Because that doesn't work for me. I know that part is no good. The things of the world are no good. It's going to come to an end. And all things I do now are for the everlasting kingdom. But I want to be a true representative of the kingdom. Not by what I'm saying. I want my, the way I live my life to speak much louder than I could ever speak. If somebody heard me dreaming, talking in my sleep, I wanted to edify and magnify the living God. And in order for things like that to happen, it must truly be me. I must truly change. I must truly follow that path in everything that I do. So I've truly denounced many things of the world by kicking them out of my life because they don't belong in the ways that the Lord has established. And you know what I found in doing so? I found true joy and true peace. Which is why I'm never upset. I get loud when people want to fall. Isn't that what you do when there's an emergency? You start yelling, hey, get up. Nobody likes it when you do that child standing in the tree, street uh, two, uh, no, tractor trailer is about to hit him you might yell to run and go get him but that's not negativity right I desire that my life be an example to be an ambassador to Christ is to walk the way of Christ in this world I know I'm in the flesh but my lifestyle must be just like the gospel if my lifestyle cannot convey the gospel, then I'm not living it. And if I'm not living it, and I'm just speaking it, I'm full of hypocrisy. Full of it. Lord have mercy. The Lord is bringing us to this point. The Spirit of the living God is pouring out. Stand to receive the Spirit of the Lord in truth. In the words of Christ only. 
don't settle for the diluted gospel that's mixed with every doctrine mankind could ever find. They put so many fingerprints in truth, you don't know what to believe. But I tell you this one more time. People have a lack of faith because somebody else's knowledge is fighting the knowledge of God. If the only book that was ever written was the Bible, nobody would have problems with faith. It's only when something else casts doubt that a person has problems with faith. Because they begin to say, well, maybe it's this way. Well, maybe it's that way. But the Lord said, be, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, what the word says. So one of the disciples said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Even they knew you must throw out this old stuff you thought you knew. And fully adopt those things. Now he grafted you into the branch. If he grafted you into the branch. And that let's just say that is a fig tree. Then why would you still want to be a grapefruit? Why? When you know you're supposed to be a fig tree branch. Not a grapefruit branch. Let's make one better. He grafted you into a fig tree. But you want to remain a watermelon. Or potato. That won't work, will it? That wouldn't work. To graft something in. It, it, it's going to have to be one, uh, the same species. You're going to have to be turned into the species of what you grafted into. So if you began a potato, you're going to turn into a branch of a fig tree. But you don't try and keep the potato... And it has to be true. Not for the sake of appearance, ladies and gentlemen. That's not what I'm speaking of. What I'm saying is a true life change. The last thing you should ever think of is appearance. Because you know in the Bible when it says abstain from all appearances of evil, you have to do that internally. If you do that internally, you will abstain. You will be apart from all appearances of evil. No one's going to look at you and say, oh, you're evil. No, they're going to say, I know you're a Christian. People no doubt walk up to you saying the same things. You're being salted with fire. Don't fight the process. Accept it. You yourselves, you loved to be loved. Will you lay down your life for another? Because of that, there's no greater love than that. And if you will lay down your life for another, why are you begging the Lord to help you when he's already heard you the first time? He's taking you through a process for the sake of somebody else. Are you willing to go through that process? Are you willing to complete the process? Jesus sure finished his process for the sake of you. And it was far more than you can ever endure. It is not humanly possible to endure what he endured upon himself. He did that for us. Will you do it for another? Because if you do, then the entire eyes of the kingdom are totally upon you. And you're truly a joint heir with Christ. You truly are. Folks, Dr. V is coming up, hopefully. I hope Dr. V comes up. We'll be waiting on Dr. V. He should be starting up here soon. I just wanted to tell you that today. You know why? Because our Father in Heaven is so perfect. He cares for you deeply. He wants you home. You have desires in your life and His desires to have you home. He planned for you to come home thousands of years ago. He wants you home. Don't reject his love. Don't reject his teachings. His teachings are salvation. Do you not know that Jesus is salvation? Do you know that his doctrine is the door? 
Jesus is what he spoke. That's why it was written, he is the, di- the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except by him. The gospel is him. That is the way. What he said is the truth. He is salvation. He is. God bless each and every one of you. God bless you. Stay tuned for Dr. V's coming up. I just thought I'd include you in that small little study there. Dr. V, you are queuing you up, so the system will start as soon as you're ready. God bless you all this day. God bless.